Good morning. Today is October 7, 2024. And today I wanted to talk about the counter offer form or form 36. Um, with the form 36, I'm going to talk about when to use it, how to use it. We'll discuss the timelines that get put in place by using it, what is and is not mutual acceptance, and then hopefully provide some clarity with some of your questions you may have. So form 36, the Northwest MLS actually did create this form to be used if there was any counteroffer being made. So according to the MLS, the use of this form is to make a counteroffer or to counter a counteroffer. Sorry, I'm just going to ask if everybody could mute. That would be great. Um, so if you can help it, don't make changes to the purchase and sale agreement itself but rather make the change noted on the front page of Form 36. Um, and if you do choose to make a change on the purchase and sale agreement, just understand that by doing that, you need to actually have initials and dates by every change made, whereas the counter offer is more of an encompassing um, part of the offer that can be signed one time at the bottom. Now, counter offers can be withdrawn, as we know. So until an offer is fully mutually accepted, an offer can be withdrawn. This is no different when using the counter offer form. However, if you officially make an offer with form 36, it is advised that to withdraw that counter offer or withdraw any counter offer that you make, that you do it officially in writing on form 36A. I don't actually have that one in our slides today to talk about, but there is a counter offer withdrawal form if you need to use that. Now this right here is the counter offer addendum itself. As you can see, it notes everything that references the purchase and sale agreement or the offer that you're making. So everything in lines one through four is going to be consistent with the rest of your offer that you've made. Where you put in your changes um, is starting on line six. If you're going to change the purchase price, then go ahead and stick that in line seven, or, dot, or sorry, number seven. And then any and all changes that you make to this entire contract need to be listed in other. Um, there is a space to go ahead and write the counter offer expiration on the bottom. And then, of course, it does need to be signed by the person making the counter offer and the person accepting that counter offer. So knowing when to use it. Well, there are a couple different forms in our um, forms library that make changes to purchase and sale agreements. But the main thing I wanted to get kind of bullet pointed here is before an offer is actually mutual, before you have a mutually binding contract, you're still negotiating terms. So if you are still negotiating terms back and forth, do so with a Form 36 and not a blank addendum. The blank addendum is to be used for an already agreed upon mutual purchase and sale agreement, whereas Form 36, the counteroffer form, is going to be part of changing the terms in this agreement. Um, and then once signed, those terms that have been accepted are what is incorporated into that purchase and sale agreement. So how do we use this? Well, I went over some of the numbers that we write in here. The first one, the date, we that's the date that this entire offer is drafted. Again, make sure it matches the rest of the purchase and sale um, agreement and the rest of the contract because bullet points numbers one through six are just to reference what is already in place. Now, the counter offer is being made by, in line number three, Sorry, in line number three, we're going to write the person who is creating this counter offer. And then the undersigned and bullet point number five is the person who is receiving that counter offer. When you make a counter offer, this is just an example of how to do it in a clean manner. Choose the item that you're going to be counter offering. In this case, it was the purchase price. The line was hashed through the entire line that says purchase price. And instead of writing and initialing and changing on this form, I wrote C counter offer on the top. Once you write C counter offer, the counter offer actually has the purchase price that we are renegotiating and any other terms that changed within that purchase and sale contract that we're trying to get mutual. In my situation, I did have other changes, but crossing out the change, C counter offer, and then noting all the changes to be made in the counteroffer addendum. 
Here's another one. Um, we changed the price and we took away the escalation. So this is a situation where we were in a really hot market and we decided instead of using the escalation addendum and possibly miscalculating or leaving out some crucial information, we would just counter offer with the price um, and make it easy. So to do that, we crossed out line number six with the price and we removed the escalation addendum and wrote C counter offer on the top. And then when we wrote up our counteroffer, we wrote the counteroffer with the new price, the removal of the escalation addendum, and any other changes that were made within that contract. Here's another example. You can write C counteroffer over here. And then when you write the counteroffer up, it will make the changes that you've made in the purchase and sale agreement as well. So just to kind of reference back, when you're using the counter offer form, the person making the counter offer is the person signing first, and the undersigned is the person receiving that counter offer. So if it's the seller counter offering, the seller has seller's name in line three as the seller and the undersigned buyer's name as buyer. When you sign down below, the person making the counter offer is the one that signs above the box. They're also going to be the ones that decide how long this counter offer is good. Now, without any date being written in, all of our timelines do um, expire two days um, at 9 p.m. So keep in mind, if you don't write any day at all, it's two business days after this counter offer is um, delivered to the other party. Um, once a person is going to accept that counter offer, they sign within the box. And we do need to keep in mind that delivery does constitute, um, you know, all of this is based on delivery. So make sure that once everything is signed around, we are also delivering that so we can have a fully binding contract. Every change that you are making within the purchase and sale agreement goes on the form 36. There are, um, the only thing you need to do within the contract is mark up the changes that you want to make, but every change that is done needs to be listed on Form 36 if you're going to choose to use Form 36. So your two options are going to be to cross off and it fully initial and sign and date in the contract every single change, or use the Form 36, note all the changes and sign the bottom. Yes, Heidi. Oh, that's okay. You just you just answered my question. I, you know, uh, we have a new transaction coordinator now with Madrona Group, but our old one always, and she would kick it back every time, made us initial everything on a purchase and sale, even though there was a 36. So to be clear, yep. as far as you're concerned, if there's a 36, you can cross Annali. things out, but do you don't need to initial. No, and here's why. Okay. Because if you look at a contract and you see that there are things crossed off and initialed, um, that is changes that have already taken place. Then if you attach a counter offer on top of that, the way it reads is that you're counter offering that entire offer that's attached, which means it's a complete rejection of what you've already decided and you're trying to renegotiate new terms. So it actually creates a conflicting story, um, especially for somebody who's working as your transaction coordinator. So anything that is signed and initialed in a contract is something that was basically decided as this is what's happening. Um, and anything that's in a counter offer form is that is what's happening. So when you put a counter offer form on top of your contract, you're saying, I am making the changes that are noted on this form um, and any other. I mean, you you can technically, I guess you could have both initialed. You just need to be very, very careful. And the idea is to create the most clarity as possible. So if you're using the changes on a counter offer form, I would not double initial them. I would either use the counter offer form listing those changes or make those changes in your purchase and sale. And if you want to change other things, then change those things only on the counter offer form. I think it just creates a little bit more confusion. So looking at timelines. Um, remember our boilerplate language in all of our purchase and sale agreements say all of our deadlines are two business days, 
Unless otherwise noted, and all timelines end at 9 p.m., nothing can end on a weekend or a holiday. Then that's my best interpretation of those words. They're not exact. But that being said, if we have counter offers going back and forth and we are counter offering on a Thursday or a Friday, keep in mind if we do not put a date in here, then that timeline does in fact expire two business days later. You may be pulling that over the weekend um, inadvertently. Um, so please keep in mind our timelines are business days, or you can actually write a date in here. Um, if you leave it blank, it will be two days. I would highly encourage everybody to write a date. When signed over, the counter offer that was being drafted needs to be signed on the top signature line. And when it's accepted, it is signed within the box. Now, this is how it should look, not left blank, but rather just a date put in place. Um, if you want to change the time that you can accept it, you are more than welcome to go ahead and scratch that off when you send your counter offer. I would recommend also maybe initialing that or at least making it very clear on a brand new counter offer form if you are making changes that this is the expiration time. Anytime you counter offer a counter offer, make sure you are striking through the entire previous counter offer and creating a new counter offer page. We don't want to cross off an initial on a counter offer form. And then again, making sure it is signed. I don't know why I have that slide in here so many times, probably because it's so important. Um, so what I wanted to kind of show is an example of what can happen if you do or do not choose to use the counter offer form. So these exercises are to find out what everybody's opinion is if they are in fact mutual. And if so, when did mutual acceptance occur? And for this exercise, um, let's assume that the dates signed were signed within the times they were supposed to be signed and they were delivered in a timely manner. Um, so we're just going to go off those dates for now. So I redacted personal information from some of these because I want to keep them um, a little bit anonymous. Uh, but in this situation, the red represents sellers. So I have three sellers and several changes have been made as well as a um, an array of dates that were signed in here. So looking at this very carefully, we can see that the offer was drafted on September 30th. The buyers signed this offer over to the seller on the 30th. So take a second to look at this. Um, it looks like several changes have been made. And I have a slide to kind of bullet point what's happening. I'm going to go back and forth between these two slides. First part is the offer was written on the 30th. When did that offer expire from the 30th? Well, it expired on the 1st. You can see up there in the top right, it was written to expire on 10-1. Um, and then from 10-1, it was counteroffered again on October 2nd. And that counteroffer expired two days later because no offer date was changed or no counteroffer date was changed. So we can see over here, it is initialed up here on 10-1. It's initialed right here on 10-3. This is initialed on 10-2. And this is signed on 10-4. So when was mutual acceptance for this? And did we even reach it with the changes that were made? Well, it took a long time to look through this. But yes, we did in fact reach mutual acceptance. And we reached it on 10-4, which was the last date of the last signature. Um, so the agents in this one think this is mutual. Do you agree? We have four sellers, two buyers, two, or sorry, we have four people in this contract, two buyers and two sellers. The offer was written on October 1st, offer expiration on the 2nd. Did we reach mutual acceptance based on what you see? Also assuming that everything else in the contract is signed as it should be. Well, we had a counter offer change on the price and we had a counter offer change on the closing date. But if you look at those counter offer changes, they were only signed by um, the, I don't know which party signed these, I'm sorry, I crossed off all the names, but they were only signed by two of the four people that are required to sign counter offer changes. So in this circumstance, 
Mutual acceptance was not technically reached, although agents involved and the buyers and sellers seem to believe that they have reached mutual acceptance. In order for us to actually enforce any of these changes with mutual acceptance, we are going to need to go back and get initials on these two changes. Otherwise, we don't know what to put in there um, because an offer was made and, and that offer was rejected and a new offer was made in its place without being fully signed around. So no, there are four signers and the changes have only been initialed by a couple of the parties. Um, there was not a counteroffer form. Therefore, all the changes that they've made must be initialed to be mutual. Mutual acceptance will be with this one because we don't have all signatures all the way around. The way we may have to calculate this one with mutual acceptance is when the earnest money is deposited, if there is not a clear acceptance date um, and all parties move forward if this is actually mutual agreement. When was mutual acceptance on this one? Well, the offer over had expired on 831 and it was signed on 831. So we can see based on the bottom two signature blocks that we were mutual on August 31st. How about this one? Oh, my screen is in the way. Um, I, oops, sorry. My screen is in the way, but I can't see. I believe that it is also on, oh, there it is, March 30th. So we can see changes were made. The counteroffer expired on the 30th, and both the buyer and seller signed on the 30th. Mutual acceptance was the 30th. So these forms actually do provide an immense amount of clarity. Um, this is a scenario that I just wanted to run by and just see what you all think of it. An offer was sent over Monday with an expiration date of Tuesday. On Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, the sellers decide to accept the offer. They sign Tuesday at 10.30 p.m. and send over the, to the buyer claiming mutual acceptance. Are they mutual? And then what happens next? Um, what if, uh, so first of all, let's answer the first question. Are they mutual? Well, we know that if the offer expired on Tuesday, it expired at 9 p.m. Tuesday unless otherwise noted. And in this case, it was not noted. So technically that offer expired. And now the seller is going back saying they do want to reinstate that offer. And it's fine for the seller to reinstate the offer. But what needs to happen next is the buyer also then has to initial again um, because what happens in the meantime? What if the buyer decides in the meantime that now, because of this, because of this gap, um, they found something better and they can get out of this contract when they don't have a contingency out to do so. So until you have mutually signed signatures within those timelines of each other, you don't technically have mutual acceptance. And that means one party may be free to decide not to move forward with that sale. All right, here's a little Q&A. A buyer submits an offer with an expiration date of 10-5 written in. The seller counters on 10-5 at 8 p.m. and the buyer accepts on 10-4 at 9-30. So my question is, if is there a hard, um, if there's a hard date written in, does that date count for the offer and counter offering or expiring or just that offer? Meaning, can we go back and forth and figure something out until the 5th? Or once I respond on the fourth, are we done? Well, we all know the expiration date that's written on the buyer's offer just sets the expiration date for the buyer's offer only. If the seller's counteroffer did not include a specific expiration date, then it would have expired two days after the seller um, would have delivered it. So that's just based on the boilerplate language. So what this means is even if an offer expires on, say, October 5th, it can definitely be signed around the day before and mutual acceptance will be the day before. It could be signed the day before at midnight, and that would be an acceptance the day before at midnight. So the only time we need to worry about time expiring something is on the date of the expiration for that offer. Here's another question. If an offer states on line 17 on form 21 um, what seller agrees to pay and line 17B states 
the amount to be paid by seller. If the buyer is asking for more than the seller has agreed to pay in the listing, do we just cross that off and write it in? Um, does that become a counteroffer? It absolutely does become a counteroffer. Any changes that you're making on that offer will constitute a counteroffer. All offers must be done or must be drafted competently. The best way to do this is with the form created for counteroffering, which is Form 36. And yes, changing compensation is a counteroffer. I'm going to leave you with some final thoughts on best uses of Form 36. Number one, um, any mutual changes not listed in the counter offer must be initialed on the contract to be enforceable. So if you have a contract that you're making hash marks around the whole thing and making changes, every change without a counter offer addendum has to be initialed individually. A counter offer is a rejection of the offer and a new offer in its place. So everything that was decided is now no longer in play and a new counter offer will start over the clock of a response time. I would highly recommend, oh, sorry. Um, you must list all the changes on the form 36 that stay in the contract if you're using multiple counter offer forms. So uh, this example would be, you change the price to say 900,000. You're changing the price to 900,000 and you're saying inspection is going to be five days instead of 10. Um, and you know your closing date is gonna be two weeks. Um, if you counter offer that, you need to bring over all those terms that you had in the previous offer along with the changes you are making. So anything that you want to stay in the contract, say you wanted to keep all of those things, okay, fine, the price is 900, inspections five days, closing in two weeks, but also earnest money, we're gonna drop down to $5,000. So you need to list all those changes and then make the additional change of, say in this example, the earnest money. Um, when you are counter offering a counter offer, make sure you are redlining through the whole thing and keeping it behind there because we want to create a paper trail of this conversation. Label your counter offer forms if possible, counter offer one, two, three, et cetera. A form 34 is never a counter offer. Please do not find yourself reaching for this form in any situation because even verbiage that's put on a 34 can go in the other section of a counter offer form and be part of the contract. All counter offer forms must come attached with their entire offer behind it. You can't just send over the counter offer page um, and call that mutual acceptance. All offers expire at 9 p.m. If signed after 9 p.m., then the party, um, the other party must mutually sign again um, that late counteroffer if it's gone past the expiration date. And then finally, all initials and signatures with dates must be legible. Make sure that you are dragging them into the margins if you have to. Do not let names and dates be covered up by words of the contract. We have to be able to trace these find these and track them. All right, I hope I was able to teach you some things you might not have known before and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for listening. Hey Jen, is